My brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Happy Palm Sunday, my friend. We'll take a look at Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem in just a moment. But we are dealing with a subject matter that is so appropriate for what we're leading up to in that Garden of Gethsemane prayer where Jesus would pray, not my will, but thine be done. We're talking about knowing the will of God. My friend, as we took a look last week at some of the texts, and we certainly have to remember that Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. We'll look at that again in just a moment. But we get to the heart of knowing God's will by getting into the Word of God and the Word of God getting into us. Amen? I want to begin this second part of our two-part program on knowing God's will with this little rhyme. It says, when Jesus looks upon my life, and I want you just to think about this, reflect upon you bringing your life, just as I have to reflect upon me bringing my life before God. He sees everything that we're doing. Somebody said that often preachers will use that or parents will use it with children to try to constantly make them think that we are under God's thumb, that he wants to catch us doing something wrong. God sees everything. Well, he does see everything. But I like to think that he sees everything because he loves us in Christ so much that he just can't take his eyes off of us. He loves you if you're in Christ. Now, my friend, to be sure, I want to give the full counsel of God's word on this Blessed week where Jesus came into the city triumphant and where in a matter of days the tide of public opinion turned against him. So it is that you must know the full counsel of God's word that if you are rejecting Christ, God is rejecting you. You stand under the wrath of God just as I did until that moment that we come into that saving faith. In the only one who could make the claim in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. So my friend, if you are in Christ today, the glorious good news is that you and I have the Holy Spirit in us as that guarantee, that down payment, that earnest that we will be in heaven with God one day. But until then, we work out with fear and trembling the salvation that he worked in us. And so the law is important, not because it gives us our salvation. We could never keep the law perfectly, and that's why we need a Savior. But the law, of course, continues to be that tutor, that schoolmaster that leads us to Christ, first for salvation and then throughout the season of life in our sanctification. So with that in mind, I ask you this question. When Jesus looks upon my life, what picture does he see? Does he see his own reflection or does he just see me? And you ought to be asking this of God. Does he see his own likeness, the product of his hand, or just another Christian who never took a stand? Does he see a child of God, a child that he made free, living life to honor him, or does he just see me? What about the other folks that I meet along the way? Do I show them Jesus to brighten up their day? When someone looks into my eyes, can they truly see that calm and gentle peace of God that dwells inside of me? When I reach out and shake a hand, is God right there in my grip? Can they feel that strength from Him that steadies when I slip? When folks are in my presence, do they know God's Spirit is there? Can they see that He's the one who guides me everywhere? When other people think of me, what is on their mind? Do they think of Jesus Christ so gentle and so kind? I try to be like Jesus every single day, spreading love and kindness all along my way, but I'm afraid that I've failed. I couldn't pass the test. Deep inside my heart, I know I haven't done my best. I've had to fight my flesh since the day that I was born. 
It's always causing trouble and being such a thorn. And that's why His Spirit dwells in me. He's helping me to learn in every situation the way I need to turn, knowing God's will, right? He knew I'd never pass the test, and that's why He took my place. He gave His life to save my soul. He suffered my disgrace. Now I try to be like Him. I want to represent Him well. So other folks will want His gift and turn their back on hell. Other folks should see the joy that Christ has given me. They should want to have it too, especially since it's free. And they should begin to ask me, what is it they must do? Just how it is they go about getting Jesus too. And then I get to tell them this wondrous gift is free. It only takes a humble heart, a prayer on bended knee. Someday, when I'm face to face with the Lord who set me free, will He see His own reflection? Or will He just see me? My friend, we're talking about the will of God. And certainly in this week that we celebrate Palm Sunday, we think about what would happen just in the days to come. I don't want to get into the Resurrection Sunday message until next week, but I certainly point to something that I mentioned in last week's program, that if we are going to be that Ephesians 5, 1 imitator of Christ that we're called to be, then we have to do as Jesus did in that moment of conflict in His life. When He was torn between what His feelings were indicating would be best for Him and what He knew in His spirit man was going to be the will of the Father. And that's why He could cry out, Isn't there some way that you could take this cup from me? Now, we don't understand this in its depth because you and I were born into sin. Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit. He was born sinless, He lived sinless, and He died sinless. But He took sin upon Himself on the cross. He who knew no sin became sin, that you and I would become the righteousness of God in Christ. So he knew that in that moment he took your sins and my sins upon himself, that there would be a rift with God, and he would cry out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He saw all of that coming, but he did it anyway. He went through it for you and for me. But it wasn't without conflict, was it? And it wasn't without him asking a sincere question. To ask a sincere question is not to sin. Lord, is there some other way that this could work out? And you've asked that question, and so have I. We've asked it when we've come from the doctor's office, or when we've come from some court, or when we've gone through some upheaval in our life. But we know God doesn't make mistakes. We talk in human terms as though one of our loved ones died prematurely. No, that loved one died exactly on time. It's just that we don't get it because we're not perfect and He is perfect. He's the Alpha. He's the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He sees the end from the beginning. He knows His will for your life and mine. And what we spend our sanctification years, if He gives us years, but we spend our sanctification working out with fear and trembling the salvation that He has worked in us, and we're trying to learn the perfect will of God and to live it. Amen? My friend, I want you to take a look at the first Scripture verse as we come into this second and concluding portion of knowing the will of God. Take a look at your screen. Proverbs 2 Verse 6, so clear, so succinct, but so meaningful to us. For the Lord gives wisdom. Now, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? We know that. So the Lord gives wisdom, and from His mouth come knowledge and understanding. 
My friend, as we get into this text leading up to the triumphal entry, it says, when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. Now just stay with me on this because I want to go through some additional texts that we didn't have time to cover last week relative to knowing the will of God. And then we'll go back and do a quick summation of what we covered last week in case you weren't with us so that you get this full picture in this teaching of the importance of being not a hearer of the Word of God, but a doer. And to do God's will, we have to know God's will. So let's watch what happens in the life of some people that momentarily seem to be pro-Jesus. And then all of a sudden, the tide of public opinion turns and they follow suit with men. The great stumbling block to so many Christian glorious testimonies is the fear of people. It's probably why we don't witness the way we should witness. It's probably why we stay silent when we ought to say in love, no, sir, I can't agree with you in that way. Sometimes we just go along to get along. And that's why in that opening poem, does he see his own reflection or does he just see me? Does he see somebody that is committed to doing his will, even if it's uncomfortable for the moment? Or is it just another Christian who won't take a stand? My friend, to know the will of God, we recognize that he has a calling on your life. Maybe you will not be ordained to the pulpit ministry. Maybe you won't go on the foreign mission field. But if you are a Christian, God has a call on your life. He has a plan and a will for your life. And it goes beyond you. And that's where a lot of Christians miss it. You've heard me use this example, but I think it bears repeating, especially on the subject of knowing God's will. The River Jordan feeds the Dead Sea and feeds the Sea of Galilee. But why is one body of water dead? No plant life, no fish life. The animals don't come down and drink from it because it would kill them. But over here, the Sea of Galilee brimming with life. Both of them fed by the River Jordan. But you see, what happens is that the Dead Sea takes what the River Jordan gives. And then it just keeps it to itself. And it becomes stagnant. And that's where a lot of Christians live their life. The Bible speaks of that kind of Christian that they will make it to heaven. If they've trusted Christ as Savior, let me personalize it. If you have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, by His amazing grace, you will be in heaven. Because it's not about your track record, it's about the track record of your Savior. Amen? He who knew no sin became sin, that you and I would become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. But it goes on to say that there will be some who make it to heaven as though barely escaping the flames. My friend, you don't want to go to heaven that way. You don't want to stand before your Savior empty-handed. We're thankful for His grace that can be extended even to the thief on the cross, who in those six hours that all three men were there being crucified, and they had on either side of Jesus criminals who in fact both were hurling insults at Jesus when they began that morning. But one of the criminals had a change of heart. And that shows us that in the will of God, there is the Redeemer in the center. There is a rejecter to one side, and there is one who has repented on the other side. Where do you stand today? In this glorious week when people were throwing their cloaks down and the palm branches before the Savior, some of those same people just days later shouting, Crucify Him! Where do you stand? The Redeemer is in the center. There are receivers on one side and rejectors on the other side. My friend, when we know the Savior, we must know that He has left us here with a purpose. And He would say to Peter, Do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then feed my sheep. You don't want to stand before the Lord one day as though barely escaping the flames. We're thankful for the thief on the cross who stopped 
hurling insults at our Savior, who repented, who said, remember me, please, who came to that saving faith, though it was so infantile, so childlike, that he simply said, please remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus saved the man. Truly, I say to you today, you'll be with me in paradise. But what a wasted life, lived in sin, lived in criminal activity, going into glory with nothing to lay at the feet of Jesus. My friend, there are many Christians, and they sit in the local church faithfully every Sunday, and they write out a check, perhaps, every time there is a need at the local church. And I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful that if they have truly trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, they will be in heaven. But there are many people who are like the Dead Sea. They take and they take and they take. They listen to preaching. They listen to great worshipful music. But they never share it with another person. They never give of themselves in the feeding of Jesus' sheep. The Sea of Galilee takes from the River Jordan but doesn't hold on to it, doesn't keep it. Instead, through tributaries and other creeks and bodies of water, it releases what's been given to it. And constantly it is being replenished. And there's life. My friend, that's how we have been called to live these earthly years, receiving freely from the Lord and freely giving to those around. I want to come full circle to knowing the will of God. But I want you to put it in context with what we are celebrating this very week. And when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying, Go ye into the village over against you in which are entering into and shall find a colt tied whereon Yet never man sat, and loose him, and bring him to me. And if any man asks you, Why do you loose him? Thus shall you say unto him, Because the Lord hath need of him. And they say that as they went their way, they found even as he had said unto them, and as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto him, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now, at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they're hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. My friend, I commend to your reading, not just at this time of the year, but all through the year, what it meant to have the triumphal entry into Jerusalem just has been prophesied hundreds of years in advance, and then to look very clearly at the heart of certain men who were crying out, praise be to God, Hosanna, spreading their palm branches, spreading their cloaks on the ground before him, and within a matter of days, shouting, crucify him. I want you to take a look at this next verse as we consider today what it means to know the will of God. This, along with 
John 3.16 is very often one of the first scripture verses that children learn in Sunday school. Psalm 119, 105. Thy word, Lord, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I want you to think as it relates to the will of God. That when we stumble in darkness, my friend, it hurts when we stub our toe. But the word is a lamp unto our feet. God's word illuminates our pathway. You see, you and I come out of a dark situation. We come out of a past where our hearts are deceitfully wicked. And that's why last week we talked about the importance of delighting in the will of God. And that Psalm 40, verse 8, which we read last week, Psalm 40, verse 8 says, I delight to do thy will. O oh my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. And then, of course, we looked at John 5, 30, as we're talking about what he would say within the garden. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. My judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. And then, of course, to recognize that he is saying to you and to me, you have to be in the word of God. You have to know that this book called the Bible is the means of knowing life's treasures because it is the one who points us to the heart of the treasure giver. My friend, let me just make a comment that many people are looking forward to heaven and we should. Because there'll be no more sin. Because there'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more sickness. But you see, what we're really doing is missing it just by a little bit. We're not missing heaven. In Christ, we make heaven. But the fullness of the joy of heaven is not the benefits that we receive. But rather the very fact that we will be in the presence of God. The one that we have worshipped from a distance we now will worship in heaven face to face. I've asked many people this question in more than 30 years of ministry. How long would it take you to understand some of the great and deep mysteries of the Bible if Jesus were still physically walking the earth and he agreed to stop by your house every morning for just a half an hour? Maybe you have breakfast together. And maybe you sit in your living room uh, on the couch together. But for 30 minutes, you can ask him and pour through what he tells you to look at in Scripture. I think of the two on the road to Emmaus. What a Bible study that must have been for them to be pondering the occurrences of the day and the crucifixion. And now to have someone appear walking on the road with him and to find out at some point that it's the risen Savior the Lord Jesus Christ himself walking along the pathway. Well, I think that both of those men would say to you, it wouldn't take very long if Jesus stopped by your house for half an hour every day. And my friend, he can do that, not physically, but in his word. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And now we have the written logos, the expression of God. If we're going to know the will of God, we've got to open the word of God and we've got to write it upon our hearts. I believe in order to be motivated to do that, we have to, by faith, say, your pathway is being illuminated, Lord. And when I leave that pathway, I'm walking in darkness. And so we check our motives and we see that they're pure. How do we do it? By gauging them next to the word of God. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. And then our will has to be surrendered to God. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. I urge you, he's saying, my brothers and my sisters, in view of God's mercy, what he has done to save you from hell and to save you unto heaven, offer all that you are now, offer your bodies, your mind, your soul, your spirit, everything about you as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. 
Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. That totally new form. I mentioned last week that Greek word metamorphosis means a changing of the form, just like the caterpillar into a butterfly. You and I, the old you, the old me, now transformed into the new man in Christ. And now by the renewing of our mind, we are able to test and to approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Knowing His will, we've got to look at the facts surrounding well, the decisions that we are being called upon to make as a parent, as a child, as one who's in business, perhaps, or working for somebody else. And we come to recognize that Proverbs 2, verse 6, For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. It is his word being spoken. My friend, you have 168 hours. I do too. Every person on the planet alive in this week has been given 168 hours. It's the great equalizer. I've asked this question of you before via this very television program. How much time do you spend listening to worldly news on your local television? Do you believe everything that your local news report gives you from Washington, from North Korea, from uh, Berlin, from the Kremlin in Moscow? No, we don't believe everything we hear in worldly news, but we spend a lot of time delving into it. It's interesting. It, it gets our mind going and it's worldly in its curiosity. And what about your local newspaper? Do you believe everything you read in that paper? No, you don't. But you spend a lot of time, some of you, pouring through every page. But if I ask the question, do you believe this book, the Word of God? Do you believe every bit of it is the light unto your path, the lamp unto your feet? I believe you would say a hearty amen. You do believe that. And my friend, how much time are you spending pouring through the book that you say you believe? Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for what we celebrate on this Palm Sunday and what it means to us to stay the course, that we sing our hallelujahs and mean it. We stay within the context of your will. We know your heart and we live it out. We can't do it on our own, Lord. And so I pray for everyone watching this program and I pray for myself that we would be in the center of the circle of your will, living it out daily, that we might be used of you to feed your sheep. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can contact Duke Duvall at WTJR-TV, 222 North 6th Street, Quincy, Illinois, 62301. Or go to his website, www.dukedevall.com. Be sure and join us again next week for Conquering Your Giants.